Hello, my name is Daniel Chimera Trevor, and welcome back to the Green Talk Show. Today, I will be your host, and today we are discussing promoting economic growth in, in an environmentally friendly matter. Now, um, the reason why this topic is so special is because for the case of Uganda, this is a nation filled with a lot of ripe chances to develop and grow. But we want to, to do so in such a way that it will not come to a cost whereby we shall be forced to constantly be moving around with facial masks to protect ourselves from all sorts of hazardous uh, releases from factories, cars, and so many things like that. Um, now, uh, for my guests today shall be uh, Nadia Kanata. She is the head of section uh, for sustainable development, uh, and she's part of the delegation of the EU to, to Uganda. Thank you so much for uh, coming on tonight. And next up, we have uh, Mr. Solomon. Uh, we have Samuel at Talwi. He's the, the CEO for Eco um, Bamboo. Uh, he shall explain more. And then lastly, we have uh, Solomon uh, Sir Wanji who's a former news personality, and now he's the current executive director of the AIIJ. He will explain more about that. So uh, those shall be my guests today. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, my, my hope is today that whoever shall be watching this they shall walk away thinking more green and thinking how they can play a better role to making this world better. So first and foremost, like I have shared so far, we need to build back. We need to build forward from this pandemic green. We need to look at what, what we have so far and see what are the chances, where are the places whereby we, we can maximize. Uganda, like said before, is the uh, ground for a lot of chances, a lot of potential. But we want to develop in such a way whereby it will not cost us. Because what is the use of having um, nice tall buildings, uh, nice, nice rides and such things? if we will be forced to wear face masks. And personally, I've had enough of masks. This pandemic has shown me that um, medicine isn't my calling. So now my first uh, guest speaker shall be Samuel. Uh, uh, 
may you please uh, turn on your microphone? No? Hello? Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Uh, everyone. Uh, Mr. Daniel, thank you for hosting us today. Uh, Mr. Solomon and Nadia, thank you for being part of this. Uh, my name is Denua Samuel. Uh, I'm the CEO for Eco Bamboo International. Uh, this came up as the urge of giving back to environment. Looking at Uganda as one of the beautiful environment that everyone would love to come and visit, have a feel how it is. Uh, Eco Bamboo came out in that some of the uh, some of the youth, some of our elders have really done more harm on our environment, and this has caused very many catastrophes around and challenges. And some of them, you find that our members, our community, our local people don't understand what climate change is. Uh, we came up as Eco Bamboo to start, to start planting bamboo. <laughs> this bamboo grows within four years. And after four years, there is a positive change within the environment. Uh, bamboo does a lot of things. You find that you can use it for, for fuel. You can use it for utensils at home. You can go ahead and do craft work. You can use it in eco-tourism. So all this is really promoting the, the, the different sectors. And we had a view of, of, of doing it in that it is sustainably helping the environment, but at the same time, improving on the people's lives. Because if we plant bamboo, the, the, the carbon sink mm -hmm. will be created. And, but at the same time, the person who is selling off bamboo poles or the person who is going ahead and doing bamboo craft work is employing very many people in that chain. So there is that improvement of employment and, and at the same time, there is that part of environmental improvement. So what is climate change all about? Uh, climate change? Yes. Um, yes uh, my, my hope is you could uh it, it explain that better and then uh explain to today's viewers that um th this is not a threat that uh we shall face 50 years from now 100 years from now that this is something that is happening now because um when we go to uh the west we see heat domes we see wildfires in turkey australia uh, wiping out lots oh, 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 of wildlife. So um, explain to today's viewers what is climate change? Yeah, climate change is a change in the normal weather pattern. That would be the simplest way someone can understand. But to give it a more meaningful meaning, I would, do, I would say that these are the different changes that are happening within our environment and they are causing, and they are causing impact either on human activity or on human life or environment or nature. You find that uh, Uganda didn't you may Would you please, um, uh, sir, May you please list some examples so that uh, that uh, a person watching here doesn't think that uh, because they see um, something happening 
No, my point here is that you can break it down and really say that the, the reason why you don't see rain isn't because uh, you upsetted your ancestors. No, that is because you're not planting trees. That is what my target is here. Can you explain more there? Okay, so an example I can give first is the floods. When you got to Uganda, we didn't, we, we, we used not to have floods. But because of the human activities that everybody is doing, uh, I'll, I'll give out an example of wetland degradation and clearance. So the more, the more we do this clearing of wetlands, we are, we are reducing on the water reservoirs. And if this is happening and we are not taking action, of protecting these reservoirs, floods will really increase because if you look at Lake Victoria alone, cannot hold all the waters that we have. Uh, another thing is the forests that we are cutting, the trees that we are not planting or replacing. All right. It yeah, seems this... we have lost Samuel briefly. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I was talking about the tree planting and the tree cutting of forest, forest destruction. All this, if we don't do it sustainably, we find that we are, we, we are causing much impact on the, on, on, on the environment and the and it's causing a very big climate change. How? That human activities are so many. Uh, I, I look at the fuels, the burning of coal, the burning of the, the gas. Uh, uh, you look at the different activities. I would, uh, I would look at even the local way of, of cooking food by use of firewood. So that emission that we normally release goes into the air and when it reaches into the air it can no longer be absorbed by the forest member we have cut them away so that brings back an impact on our lives so climate change is really what, what i can tell the, the viewers that it's happening even now as we are here climate change is happening but as the different people who are in the different entities really need to come on board so that we handle the climate issue together. Because I would give an example of someone so who is in... Uh, uh, um, you have mentioned that this is a real threat and, and you have stressed it. Thank you so much. But now, there is no use of bringing out a point without providing a uh, solution. Now, you mentioned uh, firewood. How would you propose that people can, can find a replacement for that? Um, because most people, they want to do something, but they don't know how. How would you propose they work on that? Uh, Samuel, back to you. Yeah, for the, for the issue of firewood, we can we can do it in very many ways. First, if if we can go for green technology and green energy, uh, let me say use of gas, uh, use of solar energy for cooking, it would really improve on 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 the on on, on the stress that we are putting on the forest to provide firewood. We can, we can as well look at electricity because 
we have enough electricity that we can use. But I think here we need to talk to the different authorities, uh, our political leaders, so that they, they also understand very well the, the, the impact and how are they connected to environment? How are they connected to climate change? What would be their advice? And all of this will really help the community to change their mindset. I think that would be the best part of it, that everybody should understand how to handle and have a mindset change. Because if we don't have a mindset change, there is nothing that can be done. Okay, thank you so much for your say. My hope is that whoever has been watching has been uh, picked something. Now, um, to my next guesses, Mr. Solomon and Ms. Uh, Kanata, let me, uh, let me uh, mention s something abroad here. What is the role of the media in helping Uganda develop a green economy. I will start with uh, Mr. Siraj, uh, since you have been there longer. Thank you. I love the way you pronounce my name. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my name is Solomon Serwanja and uh, I am the Executive Director of the African Institute for Investigative Journalism, which is a non-profit organization that is using investigative journalism as a tool for advocacy. And thank you for raising, thank you so much for inviting me for this discussion today. And let me just draw you in into the National's Development Plan, which is the Uganda National Development Plan 2040. And I think that will answer your question pretty well. So as a country, we have the National Development Plan, which of course looks at how Uganda is going to be and what is the road plan or route plan for us to be in the middle income state or better still, first world, so to speak. Now, part of that plan is to establish 25 industrial parks. And Uganda and the NRM government is prioritizing industrialization as a, a method to grow our economy. And so we're going to be building a lot of factories and a lot of industries. And to that effect, uh, the Uganda People's Defense Forces has been given green lights to construct the 25 industrial parks across uh, a 10 year plan. And uh, we, uh, we know that government is going to be releasing money um, you know, very soon, especially after the Uganda Investments Authority, uh, you know, last week and I think the other week, they were all going all across the country to secure land to construct the 25, um, you know, industrial parks. We already as a country have eight industrial parks. You know, we have one in Namamve, we have in Boyogere, we have in Jinja and um, in other parts of the country. What is important, though, for us is to concentrate on how these industrial parks are going to be built. Are they going to be eco-friendly or are we actually going to just attract investors to come and set up factories because we want to employ our people? What we are seeing in China, for example, the, which, of course, is the industrial capital of the world where we have so many industries, China, China, uh, China Japan, um, and, and, and the, the central conversation around climate change and how the G, G8 are all talking about China and how it needs to pay particular attention to climate change by supporting, you know, the global south. If we do not pay attention to how we are selling our industrialization agenda without, you know, incorporating the issue of the e-economy, then we're most likely going to be in the place that China is in right now and the developing world, and that's the global north, they are, you know, you know, for example, China is one of the biggest polluters, you know, the US, um, you know, we, we have Japan. And so the conversation has been now that how do we actually support Africa um, through carbon, you know, the carbon dating thing where we, you know, they give back to people who are planting trees and through different initiative to preserve the environment so that, you know, we take in, we try to, to you know, absorb the, the, the pollution that is from the West. Now, it is very important for Uganda to pay attention to its industrialization process to incorporate 
you know, the E, the economy, the eco-friendly economy. Do we see government doing that? I think that what we are looking at right now is many of these industrial parks are in green zones, so to speak. I mean, a classic example is the Namanve, um, Namanve plant, uh, the industrial park in Namanve. We're seeing very mon many more investors coming and they're clearing a huge chunk of trees and biodiversity. And the question is, are we replacing that biodiversity that has been cleared to set up industries? Are we incorporating tree planting within these urban you know, industrial parks or even the industrial parks that are going to be set up across the country? I think that we need to pay attention to the designs that have been placed by the Uganda Investments Authority and indeed by those that are going to set up factories and industries. I think as a country, we need to you know, examine those plans. Do they incorporate... You know, you know, tree planting, do they incorporate climate change? Does Uganda actually incorporate climate change in the industrialization? An agenda, even as we set up the 25 sorry sorry i i think you lost me there but i'm back so I, i'm just trying to say that the media and indeed investigative journalism has a critical role to play to examine um and to put government back in line and and, and to police government whether indeed the industrialization agenda is actually in line with the global climate change conversations do we have, for example, what criteria does the Uganda Investments Authority follow while approving the investors? Or are we actually just attracting whoever investor that is going to be coming into the country and sacrifice on you know and sacrifice the the, the lush greenery and, and, and the tree planting and uh, sorry, the, the, the green coverage in industrial parks. So I think that the media and indeed investigative journalism has a critical role to play in advocating for climate change, even when government is So it's, sorry, again, um, I think my network is jumping on and off. But I, I just wanted to say that investigative journalism has a critical role to play in putting government to account and, 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 and also questioning the people in power in terms of what criteria are they following. Yes, we have the 2040, you know, um, strategic plan, but does that strategic plan actually translate into the green economy? You know, what evidence do we have? What can we look at the plans that are going to be approved by the Uganda Investments Authority? Are we able to look at the plans that, that are going to, are we able to look at the, for example, the environmental impact assessment reports that have been presented by the different, you know, industries that want to be set up? And I think the role of investigative journalism here comes in very handy. And so what we're trying to do at the African Institute for Investigative Journalism is try to interest, you know, investigative reporters to pay particular interest to Uganda's industrialization agenda. And, and we're looking at how do we partner with, with journalists across the country to actually do some cool investigations around climate change, but as well as doing investigations around the key issue of industrialization of this country. And I think this is uh, in part to answer your question, uh, Daniel. Ah, is Daniel there? Oh, we lost him. So I'll, took, I'll take on the moderating role, I guess, um, <laughs> as, as he comes back. So, so I, I was just trying to, um, you know, explain how journalism and how investigative journalism is very critical in the conversation around climate change in Uganda vis-a-vis -vis the industrialization agenda. We may have a huge appetite to attract investors into the country. And we are, you know, we are telling everyone, come and invest here. We will give you free land. We'll give you electricity. We'll lower the cost of production. But at what expense? And I think that the media has a critical role to play you know, as a watchdog to society. And investigative journalism has a, has a very critical role to play in actually, you know, 
digging deeper to to question some the, the uganda's development agenda yes we've lost daniel but i think it's time for me to uh <laughs> bring you in um on board to sort of tell us for example what are the interests of 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 of, of the development partners in the climate conversation climate change conversation and indeed uh, the the industrialization agenda uh, of Uganda and, and and what role do you play as development partners in this conversation, Nadia? Thank you, Solomon, and great moderation. Well done. <laughs> you took the role very well. So good evening to everybody. My name is Nadia. And uh, as mentioned at the beginning, I'm the head of section for uh, sustainable development. So I'm coordinating the team at the European Union dealing also with climate change, environment, biodiversity. And, um, and I think that I would like to, to, to explain quickly two aspects of what we do. One, which is more, you know, the engagements that we have and why do we reflect them in the way we work with Uganda and we support Uganda. And second, in concrete, what does it mean? Because, you know, we tend to see big engagement like the Paris Agreement, national determined contributions, where we want to reach targets, we want to become climate neutral. And I think it's important to go a little bit more to a lower level sometimes and explain, OK, but what does it mean in practice? How do you translate that? And uh, at the European Union, this has been a discussion that has been extremely prominent in the past few years because we came up with an extremely ambitious agenda, both in our continent and in our ex through our external cooperation, which is called the Green Deals. Green Deals meaning that in every sector of work, first on the continent and then in what we support abroad, we need to have a very strong climate, uh, um, climate uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, perspective. So we need, in whatever we do, to contribute to a positive impact on the environment and mitigate the effects of uh, climate change. So this gave us this big ambition that then we have been uh, translating in our cooperation with the countries. And for example, Uganda has been one, really, I would say one of the pioneers in uh, on the continent for the EU, at least, to promote the concept of green economy. A few years ago, we came saying, OK, one of our two big priorities in the countries is to promote green economy. And we took the fact that the, there was the approval of the green growth development strategy. So we say, OK, 2017, Uganda approves the green growth development strategy. Based on this strategy, we have something to anchor our actions uh, to. And we can, from that, there were a number of sectors eh, the, uh, in this strategy. And we say, OK, let's try to design together with the main stakeholders in the country. And by main stakeholders is both government, private sector, civil society, what, how we can support. And this is how we can support ended up being a number of very different uh, interventions. And when you ask what's the role of the donor, is really to link these big commitments to concrete actions on the ground, to say, okay, we, have, we can bring additional funds, we can bring maybe knowledge, we can bring um, lessons learned from other places that could maybe work here. And we can, in our dialogue, identify how we could support this agenda in the country. And there are really many actions that range from work, uh, supporting a lot, for example, the greening of the energy sector or uh, supporting a lot um, cities, even secondary cities to become more green, to do investments on waste management, on water management, so that they can allow a growth which is more sustainable. But it also means, and that's where maybe I wanted to give an example because I find it quite interesting and hands-on, it also means finding the right instruments to support the private sector. So you mentioned how much the private sector, Solomon, is important. And uh, we, we, in, uh, we have a number of facilities where we really want to put at the core the micro, small and medium enterprises, who are those that are creating a lot of jobs in the country. And micro really means from very small, companies to medium companies. And we want to see, OK, how can we support them to invest more in recycling, in, waste, in, waste. in companies like Eco Bamboo, 
uh, and help them to bring the very innovative ideas uh, and, and make them a reality. So I just want to mention one program because I, it's accessible online and I find it a very good example of this, which is called UJEFA. UJEFA is a program where we target micro, small and medium enterprise. They are supported from the very early stages of developing their ideas. And then they go through an acceleration. So a lot of technical assistance uh, of uh, business support of how to develop their plans and their ideas and how to make them interesting for financial institutions. And then thanks to this program, we directly partner with financial institutions and we also train financial institutions to tell them, look, there are very good ideas in Uganda. There is this company that wants to produce some Nadia, did I lose you? Um, All right. Sorry, Daniel. When you left, when you left, I, I I sort of stepped in for you, so I became the moderator. But over to you. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> I think we've lost so Nadia. Much. Yeah. Um. How about this? Let's discuss. Uh, this. This exist in the country, but I just want to finish by saying that when we speak about green economy, we cannot not speak about purely conservation activities. You cannot have only an economic approach to environment and climate. You also need to do conservation. You need to protect what's remaining. You need to, you need to protect the natural assets. You need to protect the animals. You need to protect the natural forests that exist and are still there. So for me, it's important to really keep always in mind that the two go together. You have a green economy approach while you have a purely conservationist and biodiversity protection approach. Sorry, so, um, I stopped. So, um, this is just, uh, from what you, you said, yes, you have mentioned that there, there has been headway, there have been plans put in, uh, strategies, and yes, there has been some success to some level. But my hope is. Uh, can you mention some blocks, some uh, uh, problems that are still existing right now, uh, which have prevented uh, these programs from becoming bigger than what they have become now? Let me just give an example because uh, it's uh, connected to what I explained uh, before, so not to spread too much what I'm saying, but a concrete example is that when you are a micro, small and medium enterprise, you really struggle to access financial means. You struggle a lot. And, though, and, and on the other side, you're a big contributor to the economy. You struggle because of many reasons, <laughs> many, many reasons. So it's very important that the, that the support is given to, for example, private sector operators on many levels from the business environment to really their own capacities uh, to help them become formal, to help them reach the best type of financial support that they can get. So there is a lot of work around that. But what is true is that many ideas cannot become a reality because they cannot, they cannot access the financial means that they need to make it a reality. That's a big struggle, especially for who wants to do innovative innovative actions okay so um my next question should be um how uh you uganda having one of the youngest populations worldwide and it making up close to 70 to 75 percent of the total people here how would you support them more uh, apart from these programs? Because knowledge is necessary. So how has the EU been promoting that um, we teach the people that we need this? So I think you are absolutely right. Okay, environment is a completely shared responsibility. It has no age. But what is true is that those that will suffer the most are the youth. Because they are the ones that moving forward, if things don't change, will have the greatest impact. 
compared to older generations. So that's for sure. On the other side, it's also an opportunity. So there are two levels that we need to see here. One is how do you support youth to be able to be ready for the jobs of the future? Because the future has to be green. So it has to be, you don't have an alternative. And uh, so it's very important that from the educational perspective, like for example, skilling and TVET, that donors support the skilling and TVET that prepare youth for these type of jobs. So, you know, it's type of, uh, and, and, and there is a lot of digitalization eh, that is very important when you speak about climate change and, uh, um, I would say, environmental friendly jobs and digitalization is by definition much stronger among the youth so there is a big potential there but then there is also a very important role that youth can play and i think that the type of work that you do is a great example of that and i really want to commend you for that honestly because a big uh, a big role that you play is to educate the older generations those that didn't grow up thinking that the world may have an end. So there is these two parts, you know, it's preparing the youth for, uh, for the future jobs. And on the other side, helping the youth to be the voice of, of what is happening and to be able to then uh, uh, work with the youth to raise awareness about these issues. So I would say it's both a professional and a personal level that that the youth can play a great role now um i'm going to ask you sir the same thing how would you promote the youth well i think i agree with nadia um first of all the the young people and and, and i think journalism has a, a role to play to um, interest young people passionate about climate change and about, you know, green energy. Oftentimes, people find climate change conversations boring. They find, I mean, someone would rather watch, you know, someone would rather watch a movie or a series than climate change documentary. And this is the same thing that even happens in the newsroom. I can tell you, in many newsrooms, and I've, I've, I've done 13 years in the game, Whenever you pitch a story around climate change and trees and, you know, there's a big story, there's a political story, there's, you know, there's press conferences, there's parliament, there's all these things. And so stories around climate change are not given priority, the priority that they deserve, right? So oftentimes when you pitch such a story in the newsroom, it's most likely that the editor will say, um, we'll work on that, you know. And also the way, even if you're given an opportunity to tell this story, journalists do not have a nice way of actually telling this story in a sexy way. Let me borrow the word sexy, especially for the young people on the call. So, so, so how do we therefore, as the fourth estate, as journalists, try to make climate change stories relate with young people? You know, how do we, for example, interest young people to be interested in stories around climate change. And this is where, I mean, I'm speaking from where I come from, and that is the journalism industry. I think that we need to change the way we tell stories around climate change to interest young people to get on board. We need to make them relate with the story, you know. So that means that our art of storytelling needs to change, which in itself calls for training of journalists to actually tell the climate change stories in a better way that is more compelling rather than just putting statistics and reporting the UN's climate change conference, the, these declarations, and putting all these things in people's faces without relating, relating to them. I think that there's a need, and, and Nadia, this is where perhaps you may need to come in you know, as, 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 as a development partner to support the African Institute for Investigative Journalism in training journalists in telling and communicating stories around climate change in a better way. Let me give you another example, Daniel. Currently, and I'm speaking about investigations, Uganda, there's a report that was released recently that showed that Uganda had, you know, had the second worst air pollution in Africa. You know, I was reading about it. And part of that 
is because of the industry, the gases that come from the industries, but also out of the vehicles. You know, as Uganda continues to urbanize, we're importing an average of 100,000 cars in this country every single day. Many of those countries until recent were old cars, right? And so what do we see? An increase in the number of petrol stations to fill up the market. The market that of many cars that have been imported into the country. So therefore, what do we see eventually? We're seeing petrol stations importing in, you know, fuel which has high sulfur content. What that means is that the fuel that has been rejected in Europe, you know, because Europe has really high standards, you know, of, 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 of fuel that is supplied to that market. But because of our low standards, and probably because of the regulation and policies that we have, the people in the oil industry exploit, you know, that gap and that opportunity to import in fuel that has been rejected in Europe to the African market, which has high sulfur content. So what that means, therefore, is that, you know, people then bring in this fuel because of our weak loss to monitor uh, the quality of fuel. We take in this fuel, which has high sulfur content. And when we put it in our old cars, then we have heavy fumes that come out of our cars. And eventually, there is heavy pollution. And these gases go up into the ozone layer. They damage it. And then ultimately, we, 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 we are struggling with, with, with climate change. And, and so if we told a story like that in that way, that actually resonates well with the people, and the after effects of such stories that we are breathing in bad air, and therefore we are losing so many people due to respiratory tract infections as a result of breathing in that bad air, then it relates with them. And I think for me, I, I, want, to, I want journalists out there to tell these stories in a more compelling manner that actually makes the young people get interested in, in the climate change story, sorry, in the climate change discussion and agenda. And I think that investigative journalism and journalism has a critical role to play to interest young people into the climate change conversation, Daniel. You've actually touched on something very crucial. Whenever you look up a uh, things relating to uh, climate change, global warming. You're seeing big technical words that, that most gays don't make sense of. Like, um, the problem is that the people who are carrying out this research, this research, these studies, these studies, who have the actual knowledge, the first-hand knowledge, when they're talking to us, the people, now, Within, you, within Uganda, we have, unfortunately, a high population which hasn't seen a black boy before. So when you try to bring in these big words, they just think that you're showing off, you want to show um, how smart you are and such things. And yet you're trying to tell them that what you're doing is a threat. Le and let me share something. Uh, a friend, uh, he called me to uh, uh, visit somewhere, and and there was a point whereby we were seated amongst the seniors there, and they had said that the reason why we were not receiving rainfall is because the Chinese had come. I was distraught. I was like disappointed because when I looked around, I said that, no, the reason why you're not receiving rain is because... Daniel, is, because Daniel, is it me who feels that you are hanging or something? On, no, um, it's my network. It's fine. Um, so my next question would be, uh, what is the EU's uh what can we learn from different nature from different uh nations to bring it into uganda today and see where can we do better so i'm going to give this to miss uh, nadia 
and then just realized my battery is running low. So I hope it will not cut in the middle of what I will say. Sorry, if, if I disappear, it's because it's not charging. I'm so sorry. Um, so I, I had already spoken before, Solomon moderated a little bit the discussion. So I had already given quite a number of uh, information, but I, I think that as a donor, where we can help is by linking. You know, bringing uh, maybe knowledge about instruments that exist in other countries or that exist at the at the, um, at the global level or at the continental level, and see can Uganda benefit from them. I mean, it's a very personal opinion, but I always see as as a, as a possible link in a big network between what exists outside and and the role being how can I help the country to access it. But then there is a lot of knowledge that is in the country. So, you know, the idea is how can these instruments support the ideas that exist here and are generated here because you have a lot of them. Okay. So um, now, because uh, your work is mostly concerned with, with people in rural places, so how would you go in and and talk to these gays without bringing in these big numbers, these big uh, figures, how would you tell them that um, you need to change your way of doing things? Um, how would you propose we handle that? You have different ways in the sense, you know, for example, when you look at uh, in that companies that are supported, one of the important things is also to have criteria through which you assess how much what they do will impact, for example, a small older farmer will have a positive impact on a small older farmer. So if you take the example of working with product sector, very often you have a number of criteria before deciding even to provide support, which are on climate, and on impacting, on, on creating inclusion and job creation at all the levels, not only at the level of the capital, but up to the rural area. But then at the same time, you have a whole work which is to be done with the communities. And this is not set in stone. You have many, many different, uh, many, many different groups in every country, even in mine. And uh, so you need to adopt the, the thinking and the language and what you pass to the local culture. So I cannot tell you that the way of working with a community close to Kampala can be the same than the way of having a dialogue with a community in Karamoja. You just can't. So it has to come from the ground and then the people that really know the ground help them being a voice with the community. So you work a little bit at the two extremes, you see. One which is really very, very much based on the local culture and the other one which is, okay, I'm helping... Uh, a company to, to better invest, uh, a Ugandan company to better invest in the country, how do I ensure that this company will have positive effects down, down the chain? And this you do it through many different criteria, both when you select and then when you monitor. And I just go to connect my computer, so I let you for two seconds. Okay, okay it's fine. Um, someone. Uh, while she has stepped away briefly, you being a youth, um, how, how would you talk to your fellow youth that um, we need to go green? Because my view is that us telling the people that um, we don't, what what we're doing is causing this, this, and this, they'll say that that's okay for now, but is from your point of view, because you, you're doing environmental saving businesses, how would you tell, tell them that taking care of the environment can be profitable? What is your view there? Thank you. Uh, in that aspect, really, we have been doing much because uh, I've planted more than 10,000 trees with different youth. And really doing this in, in, in a way that it's a play. So we organize, we organize for tree planting and we invite the, the people in that community to first understand the basics of, the importance of trees. So we find that people are really 
have the local knowledge about the importance of the trees. But what I do is to incorporate it or to relate it to climate change so that people can understand very well how trees are connected to climate change. And that really has given me a very positive change or uh, like an action. You see that very many people are coming on board. And then secondly, you find that some of the young people, uh, especially those uh, in lower primary, uh, even those in rural areas where they, they have never even been to school. So how have I been connecting with these people is that I bring up different ways how they can really come on board, how uh, putting up events, especially in climate change events, how if I say we are going to have a match, a football match between uh, two communities or two groups of, of youth, and after playing, the every footballer will plant a tree. So in that way, their their mind has used their thinking of football, but in the other background, our, our goal is being achieved by planting trees and caring for climate, uh, the different climate actions. Uh, when I come to areas like Kampala, uh, the urban cities, that's what really we have been doing conferences calling different youth on, 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 on board and having simple discussions with them, how they understand climate and what could be their possible actions. So we find that we bring in issues like plastic, but very many are using, uh, are throwing plastic on roads, uh, within their homes, within their compounds. So we try to show them how is this plastic really causing climate change? And you find that most of them didn't know, like so far the different people are, have meant, they didn't know that in the whole world, we are using 0.3% of water that we have. You may, you may find that everybody thinks that whole water that we have, the 100% oceans, rivers, and it's being used by human beings, by, and yet, when we discuss with them and tell them that you know that we are only using 0.3, they really realize that water is so precious. So they you 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 find that in these simple, simple actions we do and the poems that we bring on board, uh, the different stories that we tell them, they show they really show the, the, the impact that someone is doing to the environment, especially among the youth. Because we've we, as, as EcoBamb, we had to first come up and say, our target is the youth because they are the future generations and they are the future leaders. But how can they understand the, the, the climate change aspect of it? So we realized that we need to do every activity with the aspect of entertainment within it. Uh, an example I can give right now is the MyTree initiative, whereby we're having uh, a trees for memories that will happen soon. So what we do is that we do car washing as something that is in, for entertainment, but our goal is to do the tree planting. So in the process of, 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 of uh, car washing, uh, we are also educating the people about trees of memories. Uh, at the same time, under my tree initiative, there is a web tour that is coming on board soon. So all these ones, as people are going for the world tour, to understand, like to have fun in the world, there is climate awareness that is happening. I uh, thank you so much for your sake. I think uh, what we can wrap with uh, what we can uh, discuss and briefly while, while we uh, wrap up is that um, I was hoping that Miss Nadia uh, can reassure the people that it is still possible for us to do something about climate change and that there is still hope. So ma'am, uh, back to you. 
So Daniel, please, yes. <laughs> no, no, there, there, is, there is hope. <laughs> what is true is that, uh, what is interesting is that there is a, a more and more awareness about, about the fact that climate change is probably the biggest threat we have at the moment that we really need to face all together. But this, I think it's very difficult to say, for me, hope goes hand in hand with responsibility <laughs> in the sense that we cannot hope that th th there is a very nice sentence that, by the way, uh, I got from uh, my three initiative when I received the first email from, uh, I think, from Ismail, which was that uh, uh, we cannot think that climate, that, that, that the environment or the planet will be saved by somebody else. Something like this. That, that, that was the meaning. And I think that that's the key point. Yes, there is hope, but on the other side, there is a big responsibility on everybody at all the levels. You know, whatever we can do very small in our life, as someone was saying, you know, planting some trees while washing the car or contributing to little actions every day, then the hope can just increase. So I think that these little actions are those that will feed also the hope. Huh? So, yes, there is with responsibility. That's true. Um, like I've mentioned, that uh, uh, climate change is not a problem for one country, for one part of the world, that no, we are all uh, paying the price and we're all taking part to make this problem. However, we all still play a part to make it better. And we just need to learn how to do more. Um, like, like we've shared here, that this is not uh, something which can, can, can be handled within one day, within one week. No, it will take time. But like a, like a viewer has mentioned that every small action we make, be it planting trees, be it um, uh, repairing uh, broken things by, by making sure we reduce the plastic we throw away and instead decide to recycle it. We're all playing a part to doing something. And with that, thank you so much for coming, Miss Nadia and Samuel. Um, I, and also for uh, my last guest, Mr. Solomon. Thank you for, for coming. Uh, viewers, my hope is that you've learned something today and, the, and that you walk away learning how to, to do things better. And like Ms. Nadia has reassured us, that there is still hope for us to fight uh, climate change. And with us all playing a part, we can do something. Now, um, do you have something to say uh, to help wrap this up? On my side, just thank you so much for uh, inviting me as a guest. And I just really want to wish, wish you a lot, a lot of success with these talks. Thank so thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, Samuel? Yeah. Thank you for hosting me on this great talk show. Uh, I call upon everyone, our viewers, so that you can really come on board and we work together because climate change is happening now. And if you really understand what climate change is, just know that there is an effect that you have, you have already been affected with. So let us act together. Let us come together and save nature as one. So. Together, we, we are stronger and we can really achieve the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to all the viewers today, thank, thank you for watching. Please be sure to watch uh, the rest of the broadcastings we've so far made. And please make sure that you don't stop here and just listen and say, wow, that was nice to learn. But also make sure that you go try and do something. I...
Um, uh, and fortunately, we are having a small problem, but my last guest, Mr. Solomon, is saying thank you all for listening. And he wishes that you all pick up something and you make sure that you take care of nature. Thank you so much. Nice time. Bye-bye.